Um, three super guests, one of them you've just heard from, but I'll introduce the other two first. Um, I think we should go with the great man before we, before we go any further. Few players have stood for a nation in the way that this man did. Few players have defied the odds, and few players have batted so brilliantly, so consistently, and for so long. Few people have gone on to make quite the impact that he has in various other modes, whether it be through administration of the game, commentary on the game, or writing about the game. The image of him initially in that fabulous sun hat and then with the skull cap and eventually towards the end of his career, the nod to a helmet, the hundred here in the bicentenary match. We could go on about the performances and the man himself. Ladies and gentlemen, Sonny Galvaska. He's there. He's come from the back. Sonny. To see you. There was, uh, there was a, an incomparable image in the early part of the summer when England suffered a difficult defeat here on this ground against uh, India. The England wicketkeeper, who for so many years had done so many great things, leant forward under the wrought railing, and, and you could see that all was not well in his world. He was, just hours later, to tell us that he was pulling out of the rest of the summer, going to get his injury sorted, and hopefully come back into the game. But I, I just want to repeat one line. Ted Dexter, who, who knows a bit, said to me that in his time, as a part of the game of cricket, he had not seen any one England cricketer improve in their two spells in the team, in the way that Matt had. He pointed out that most players come in, make an impression, go out and come back. And he thought that Matt's improvement to his second stage as an England cricketer was incomparable in all the time that he'd been involved, which after all goes back to the latter part of the 50s. So he entertained us with his batting. He became a superb wicketkeeper. He held the ashes urn that Ian talked about on numerous occasions. Matt Pryor. And tonight's speaker, if he wasn't the greatest match winner that the game of cricket has ever had, maybe Gary Sobers was, maybe he was. He's certainly one of the greatest personalities it's ever had. Sir Ian Botham. <laughs> you must need some water. Hey, my friend. <laughs> what? Actually, that's the place to start. What was the Somerset dressing room like with Botham in those days? Messy. <laughs> Really messy. It was. It was fun, though. It was great fun. Uh, you had to. You had to watch your. Watch your. You know. When you sit, thank God you made him sit there. Firstly, <laughs> because if he was sitting next to you, it was a problem. If it rained, there was no play outside. He was an absolute nuisance. Absolute nuisance. You know, he would. I mean, he wanted to pass time, and he would do just about anything. One of his favorite targets was, of course, Dilip Doshi, who played for Warwickshire in those days. And Dilip would be probably the only cricketer then who used to come to the matches impeccably dressed in Savile Row suits and stuff like that. And Beef would uh, take the, uh, the whitener, the bucket of whitener, and go into the Warwickshire dressing room and, and threaten to, uh, <laughs> to, to paint the suits. And he would be running around everywhere. And you know, Dilip was uh, not exactly you send bolt. Did you ever paint a Dilip Doji suit? Or no, no, just threatened. Just threatened. No, no, it was more fun threatening. Yeah. Did, did, you, did you enjoy, you played one season in 1980 because Viv and Joel were part of the West Indies tour. Did you, did you love that experience? I, I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic because, you know, I mean, uh, till then I, I, I was a part-time cricketer, really. Um, I had a job from, from the months of June to September. I mean, I had a job throughout, but from June to September, you were expected to, to be in your office in, in Mumbai and learn what, uh, you know, uh, learn on the job. So when I got the offer to, to uh, come and play uh, for Somerset, my condition was, look, I don't want to play four and a half months. I do not want to play seven days a week. So they offered me a three-month uh, contract. 
mean, I can say that now because in those days you couldn't because TCCB, it was TCCB then. They had to be told that it was a full proper, you know, four and a half, five month contract. <laughs> but they offered me a three month contract. And uh, so when I actually started playing six, seven days a week and uh, traveling with, uh, uh, with guys who played uh, cricket for a living, it was a completely different experience. I loved the way they played cricket hard during, you know, between say 11 to six. Uh, and I loved the way, the fact that they didn't take cricket back home with them. Uh, cricket was left in the dressing room. Of course, they thought about it. Not that they didn't think about uh, you know, what had gone wrong during the day or how they could improve. But basically, it, they didn't take the game home. And it sort of helped me to relax as a cricketer. I'll tell Boycott that. <laughs> <laughs> Trouble with you, Jeffries. You never took the game home with you. In the yeah. <laughs> well, Matt, is, is county cricket, I mean, Sonny clearly enjoyed the experience. Do you, do you feel that county cricket is, is a thriving organ right now? It's, it's tricky for me to comment too much because I've, I've only popped in every now and again, obviously, as um, Syrian said earlier, mentioned earlier, central contracted players were managed by the ECB. So they would pretty much tell us when we go and play. But you've played a, a bit. Have you played at the start of this summer? Played at the start, played? yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, and my thoughts um, on it are exactly the same as, as Beefy's in that for something to, something to thrive, you need to see, people want to see the skill, they want to see top end, they want to see the top players competing against each other on whatever level it is. Um, and I think that is, that is vital. The other thing in my experience recently in county cricket is I find that a lot of young players coming through are so overcoached. Um, and what I mean by that is, Coaches have such a firm grip on teams. Obviously, the game has become very professional. You now walk off, you're straight into ice baths, protein shakes, not just going to the fridge and helping yourself to a beer. Um, but coaches now are so, um, as I say, controlling that they don't allow players to go and express themselves. We've all, growing up, made mistakes, and you learn from those mistakes. You have to be allowed to make those mistakes. I think we're at a place now where players walk out, they almost need the coach next to them. Um, and they're not able to go and make decisions for themselves, which in turn, when they then ask to go and play at Lords for their country, it becomes a bit of an issue. So for me, that's, that's the major thing for me. Mm. Right, so who, you talked about James Anderson. You talked about that eight wicket hole here where the ball swung for you. Who taught you to swing the ball or was it a natural thing? Um, well, first of all, when I came to Lords and joined the ground staff, they said I couldn't bowl. He said, Len Munster said, well, he's not bowling. He's no good. He said he can bat, but he's not, he's not a bowler. So, and then Harry Sharp took me aside, and Harry Sharp said, well, I think he can bowl a bit. And uh, with his half a cigarette hanging behind his ear, Harry. <coughs> and he, he said, look, I, I think you can. And then uh, Bill Jones, who was then the head boy at, right. at uh, here when I started, who was a bit of a swing bowler. And uh, it all started really through there. It came naturally to swing the ball at school. Uh, and I never really knew why it was happening. It just happened. Uh, and then it, you start to refine it once you start playing every day and you suddenly realize different conditions. Sometimes it will swing. There is no actual reason why the ball swings. My father, who was a type test engineer at Western Helicopters, he actually used to sit and watch, watch me play. And he'd come in and say, oh, you're swinging it nicely today. And I said, yeah. I said, I don't know maybe the right conditions. He said, can I take a couple of balls, we'll take it and we'll put it in the wind tunnels and see if we can determine at Westerns with the, the scientific uh, technology that they had there with their helicopter design. And they actually, there was absolutely, the conclusion was, there is no logical reason why a cricket ball swings. <laughs> so if they can't work it out, what chance have I got? None. I, I'm just going to, I think it's such an interesting subject, we'll dwell on it for a moment longer, over coaching it. I mean, we, we do talk a lot about swing, and we wonder if the ball swings as much as it used to. Is it conceivable that coaches are not developing actions for swing, they're protecting injury, so developing actions that work to protect spine or hip or whatever, rather than using classical methods, the, the sideways on position, wrist positions, whatever it may be, for swing, or, or is that not the case? Well, I'll give you an example. Jimmy Anderson, and I think Matt will remember this. Uh, right at the start of his career, when he started bowling, he started bowling for England, suddenly someone in the coaching department decided that they wanted to change his action. And Jimmy was struggling. This isn't the way he was bowling in Burnley. 
This isn't the way he started his career, and someone was trying to manufacture it. Oh, we don't need to do this, and we don't need to do that. And in the end, Jimmy, thankfully, saw light at the end of the tunnel, ripped up the stuff that had been written, told the coach to go fishing, <laughs> and he went back to doing what he did. His action is unique, but when you actually look at it in slow-mo, the thing that is so good about him is his high wrist. You can't teach people. You can, you can try and explain to them, but he's naturally worked out that it's... It, this is where Chris Jordan has got a lot of work to do because you cannot run a hole in the cricket ball like no. that. You've got to have it, it's loosely in your fingers here. This is your rudder and the wrist does the work. So the wrist, just the slightest of movements, that's all we're talking. So providing the rudder is doing its job and then you can disguise it. And if you want to see how to bowl swing bowling, get a video of Jimmy. Yeah.